I was telling Doris right before we started that the last time I preached a Sunday night sermon, I had a bat flying through here, and I was anticipating that the storm was going to linger and the lights were going to go out this time. So praise the Lord that the storm passed and we still have electricity. I want to invite you to open your uh, Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 22. As I said this morning, I'm skipping a couple of churches um, to go to the church of Laodicea. Pastor Glenn had asked me if I would uh, be willing to preach on this church tonight and I was uh, gladly willing to do that as the other churches have much more... uh, things to talk about, and this one I I know better than most of the other ones, so I I I graciously accepted that offer. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22 read this way. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so you may clothe yourself, and the, shame, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and solve for the anointing of your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we do ask that uh, you will uh, open our ears to hear the message that you have for us. For us as individuals, for us as a church. For us as Christians who are seeking to follow you and to uh, proclaim your greatness to the world, I pray that as we continue to uh, worship you through the hearing of your word and through singing, that uh, you will just use this time to move amongst us and to let us know where we are failing you and where we need to repent and turn back to you. Lord, we pray that we will not be like the church of Laodicea and be lukewarm, but we will be a church that's on fire and Christians and individuals who are on fire for you. And I pray that all in Christ's name. Amen. In the introduction of the letters um, to the churches of Asia and Revelation, Jesus introduces himself in a way that both gives you kind of a clue of who he is and a clue of what's going on in the church. For the church in Thyatira, he uh, he was talking about how he has eyes uh, that are blazing like fire. Meaning that he can see through the hearts of men. He sees the, the uh, sins of men and the intentions of men. And he points out that the church has allowed Jezebel to continue to cause people to fall into sin. And that they are following her instead of following the Lord. And he calls them to put her out. And he says if she doesn't be put out, if she isn't put out, he will come against her and the people that she uh, mingles with. And to the church in Smyrna, he writes, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and will come again. And this provided just kind of a hope to the church in Smyrna. They were about to face some persecution and Christ is encouraging them, listen, I've already overcome this, but be prepared. And I promise you that on the other side, Eternal life is waiting for you. And when we come to the church of Laodicea, Jesus begins the letter introducing himself as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. And from this, we can readily assume two things. Number one, Jesus is faithful and true. And number two, this church has not been faithful and true. So, we can assume that as we continue through this passage, we're going to learn things about the character of Christ and how he works through churches and how he works through people's lives and what he expects of us as we continue our walk with him. Notice that Jesus has nothing good to say about this church. In fact, he only gives harsh warnings and harsh rebukes. And that should have sent shivers down the spine of this church, but as we'll see later on, they didn't heed the words of Christ. 
So I want to, before we dive in, just kind of give you the four points that I want to go over tonight with you. The first point is, Jesus does not tolerate half-hearted commitment. Jesus does not tolerate half-hearted commitment. Jesus is the ultimate supplier of riches. Jesus rebukes those he loves. And Jesus remains faithful to us even when we are not faithful to him. You have to understand that the city of Laodicea was located pretty close to the uh, city of Colossae. They were well known for their fine wool and fine ointments. And they had an immense riches. In fact, there was an earthquake that destroyed the city and they rebuilt the city without any of the Roman Empire's help. That's how rich the people in the city were. They also served as a great trade route in the ancient times as they were strategically located by a body of water. And so all of that brought people to this kind of, this city to kind of uh, mold their spirituality. So Christianity had kind of taken hold there for a little bit, but there were a lot of other temptations in the city. There were riches, and there were people who were bringing wisdom from other parts of the world, and there were things and pleasures that were being put in front of the people and the Christians in Laodicea that were far exceeding their love for Christ. And Jesus is coming to them, and we first see this in the introduction that Christ gives to them. He says, if you put unlike you, I am, before his introduction, it would read this way. Unlike you, I am the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. We immediately see that he, unlike the church of Laodicea, is faithful. That he had already accomplished all things. He says, I am the, I, I am the Amen. So be it. All things have been accomplished. Whatever I am saying is going to be accomplished because I have accomplished all things. And Jesus says, I wish that you were just either cold or hot. Would you rather be cold or hot? So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Notice that Jesus wishes, again, that they were either hot or cold. Now, I don't want you to assume that Jesus wishes that they were Christians that were kind of just complacent, that they were sitting back and doing nothing so that they were cold in their walk with Christ. Instead, I want you to think that their temperature, their spiritual temperature would have been freezing, that they would have never even encountered Christ yet. Because at least then he would be able to have a, a, a way in and that he could actually warm them up. But instead, they've already come to Christ. They've been on fire for Christ. And all of a sudden, they've started falling back. They've returned to the ways of the world. They've been looking at the things that are around them and saying, hey, we're rich. What do we need Christ for? And Jesus is taking their spiritual temperature and he's saying, spiritually, you're dying. And in fact, you're dying in such a way that it's making me ill, that it's making me sick. And he's about ready to spew them out of his mouth. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like to vomit. I'm pretty sure probably nobody here does, but uh, if you do, that, uh, that's your prerogative. All right? I don't like to vomit. Um, but one thing that vomiting does is kind of keep toxins out of our body. It keeps germs out of our body. Um, we have this natural reaction when we see someone else vomit that, okay, now their germs are in the air, so let us vomit, that kind of thing. It's like a chain reaction. And Christ, when we get this picture here, he's not saying that he's just going to spew them out. He's going to forcibly remove them from the body. So we see that Christ sees that the church is causing more harm than good for the kingdom, and he's not going to tolerate that. He is not going to accept their half-hearted commitment, and it's making him sick. So the church is doing more harm than good. Now Jesus warns in Matthew chapter 12, remember that uh, the spiritual leaders of the time had come to Christ and they were telling him that uh, the things he was doing were of the devil, that he was casting out demons by the power of Lucifer. And Jesus says, a kingdom divided amongst itself cannot stand. And then he goes on to say, those who are not with me are against me. And so this church has kind of tried to take this middle row that says, we're not really with Christ, but we're kind of with Christ. And Christ is saying, no, that's not acceptable. You are either with me or you are against me. Either the church accepts all of the commands of Christ or they reject Christ completely. So to make the choice easier, Christ just says, I've decided that I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth in order to turn them back over to the world and finish his dealings with them. 
Now I'm sure that you remember the story of the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus and asking, how can I inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus says, keep the laws. And by his own merit, the man did it extremely well because apparently he kept all the laws and he was perfect in that area. Christ does, tells him one thing, you lack one thing, you lack devotion to me. He says, go and sell all your possessions and come follow me. You see, Christ is not interested in those who just want to add him to their already idle stacked shelves. Christ wants wholehearted commitment. There are a lot of things in our lives that can serve as idols. For one, of, one of those things for me at times uh, can be Orioles baseball. I mean, you've been around me long enough, you know, that I love the Orioles. I've been here like three and a half years now. And, so, you know, like if you go down in my office, you'll see my favorite player is J.J. Hardy. Um, I have a bunch of Orioles kind of paraphernalia things down there. Um, I mean, I just, I just love the game of baseball and I love the Baltimore Orioles. But if that love becomes a love that's stronger than my love for Christ, then something is seriously wrong. If I want to talk about the Orioles more than I want to talk about Christ, something is seriously wrong. You see, again, Christ doesn't want to be part of an idle stack shelf. He wants to be the only person on that shelf. The person that we aspire to. He doesn't want people who just dabble in the Christianity. Because he offers us so much. He gave up so much to win us. He expects us to commit to him in the same way. And why wouldn't we go? Because Christ tells us that he's the ultimate supplier of riches. He tells his church, For you say, I am rich. I have prospered and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. And white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve for your, uh, to anoint your eyes so that you may see. You see, the church of Laodicea had allowed the physical things of this world to overwhelm their spiritual sight. They were no longer able to see that they were still in spiritual needs. They still had spiritual needs that needed to be met. They believed that they no longer even needed Jesus because their physical needs were met. They were comfortable. Now we have a tendency, especially in America today, to kind of do the same thing. We want more stuff, we want newer stuff. We want newer TVs, newer cars, newer motorcycles, newer video games. Newer phones, newer houses, all of these kind of things. And the list goes on and on. And in fact, it seems like the market of America keeps throwing things at us. And we're like, wow, I really want that. You know, because the list grows bigger, there are more distractions for us that distract us from Christ. In comparison to this country, uh, in comparison to the rest of history, this country is one of the richest countries in the world. We are rich, and we all know the dangers of the rich life. Jesus tells us that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than what? For a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? Why does he say that? Because it's easier to trust the things we can see than it is to trust the things we can't see. It's easier to fill our lives with stuff that makes us comfortable than to fill our lives with Jesus. But let me remind you of something before we, we kind of dismiss this and say, well, I wouldn't do that. We are rich. This country is rich. Jesus' warning was not just to people who have multi-million dollars. It's people who are rich, who have things that they, their needs are met, but also their wants are met. We need to take this warning seriously. See, we run the risk in our country of allowing our spiritual lives to become lukewarm because of the things we can fill our lives with. So I implore you to take your spiritual temperature. See who or what you're trusting to get you through. Have you simply placed Jesus on a shelf and said, Jesus, you fit ne nicely next to my flat screen TV. You know, that's, that's the problem with the Eastern religions. They're so hard to evangelize because they're willing to say, well, we'll just take whatever God you give us. Jesus says, throw your gods away. I'm the only God you need. So, I implore you just 
take your spiritual temperature. See if you're hot. If you're hot, great, guard that. If you're cold and you've never come to Christ, make a change. If you're lukewarm, make sure you repent. I want you to notice that this church is extremely sick. Jesus describes them this way. You say I am rich, not realizing that you are what? Wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus tells them that they're in this horrible condition. And not only does he tell them that uh, they're in this horrible condition, but they don't even realize that they're in this horrible condition. They don't even realize that they're so bad off. And you might say, well, Josh, you just told us that they're rich and they have all these things. And I want you to remember, Christ doesn't care about the physical things. He cares about your spiritual health. And he says, spiritually, you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus is telling the church that they may appear on the outside to be rich, but on the inside, they are spiritually depraved. They may claim to have wisdom, all the people coming from all areas of the world claiming to have this wisdom and that wisdom, and they may have nice spirituality and say, yeah, I love God, kind of put him over here in a, in a corner and say, yeah, that, that's God over there. But they're blind to the true source of wisdom. They're blind to the true source of salvation and life. They may claim to have righteousness, but only in so much of their lives and, and in their own minds that they've done things that they think have puffed them up to become righteous. Because how could God cast out a rich person out of heaven, right? They have no sense of righteousness apart from God. You may have heard the saying, ignorance is bliss. In this case, ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is dangerous. Jesus tells this church, you are so bad off that even I have pity for you. And Jesus then, of course, he's not going to just warn them. He's going to give them the cure. He's going to give this church the cure. He says, I implore you, buy gold, white garments, and salve for your eyes. Jesus makes the judgment here that gold or faith, the faith that they have, the gold uh, represents faith in our lives that's been tested by fire. He's saying, your faith isn't going to match up to the fire. When you get to heaven, it's not, going to have, it's not going to succeed. You don't have the faith that you need for righteousness and for salvation. It says, you don't have the righteousness either that you need for salvation. Put on the white garments so that you may be clothed and holy before me. Now remember that the church of Laodicea was famous for their wool. So Christ has a unique way of making sure that he gets people's attention and he relates to them in a context that they understand. So he's saying to them, you may be able to make great wool, but let me clothe you in wool that's even greater than that, that will last an eternity. You know, the, the white garments, I've heard some various interpretations, uh, and one interpretation was, make sure you come to church with clean clothes on. And I thought, that's not at all what that passage says. We, we could come to church with clean clothes on, great. But that's not what the passage means. The passage means, get your righteousness from Christ. Be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. This is the only acceptable way that God will accept you. And it's only at this point that we begin to see our true need for Christ. We've enhanced our faith by coming and buying faith from Christ. Not, Jesus doesn't mean like you come and you dish out a bunch of money for it. Buy, buy it is just kind of a metaphor for come to me. Okay? Buy your gold for me. Buy your white garments. And I thought, well, why, why wouldn't he open your eyes first? But I, don't, I think that the salve for your eyes helps you grow in Christ. Do you ever go through life and you think, I'm sure I'm glad that Christ saved me because I am such a wretched person at times. That we don't really see our entire need for Christ until we're like going through our lives and we do something and we're like, man, I'm glad Christ saved me because I am in so much trouble. So when he's opening our eyes, he's opening our eyes to help us see our desperate need for him. And in our desperate need for him, Jesus has to rebuke and discipline us. You know, discipline today, in today's world, is kind of like a dirty word. People are telling their parents, 
parents, don't discipline your kids. People are being beat up by police officers. People are simply over-disciplining their kids because, well, they're younger and they can't fight back, so it makes me feel powerful. But in walking with Christ, there are times that we have to be disciplined. You see, there are things in our life that are abominable to him. Things that he just cannot stand. And I want you to notice that even after all of the horrible things that uh, Christ, how Christ describes the church, Christ still loves them. And the evidence of that is that he is rebuking them and giving them time to repent. You see, Jesus cares deeply about the believers in Laodicea. He cares deeply about you and me. And so much that he wants to conform us to his image. So discipline and rebuking helps us to grow into the image of Christ. So we get a picture of Christ pleading with this church, come back to me because I truly care about you. Unlike our worldly, uh, worldly parents and worldly, uh, worldly powers, we don't have to worry about Jesus' discipline being unfair or misunderstood. I want you to listen to this story about a, a school teacher. Um, and kinda, it's going to give you an idea of what happens when... Humans tend to dis- over-discipline or uh, don't take time to look at the broader situation. I used to teach in higher secondary school where classes of a much low, uh, lower secondary students had been introduced for the first time. The adjustment made a, uh, of different age-related requirements were extremely hard for my colleagues who had been teaching 15 to 18-year-olds all their lives. Being pampered by the entire school, how could you not? These little kids were all so sweet and innocent. The kids soon turned out to be 10-year-old little devils who terrorized the teaching staff. They had come with curious habits from previous schools, or at least they seemed curious, that's an understatement, for the teachers who found it hard to cope with all the questions. Shall I use the green pencil or the pink one? Or the case when during class one would simply get up and walk out of the room because, well, they had to go. Whenever a teacher entered the staff room after class, all in sweat and looking somehow lost, the usual question was, you've been teaching fifth grade today, haven't you? After a month of this ordeal, I managed to impose a sense of discipline. That is, raise your hands when you want to say something and don't walk around during class. You can imagine how I felt when one day one of the students in the back of the classroom suddenly stood up, came to my desk, just like that. I actually saw red. Everything I'd been trying to do had, been, uh, had gone down the drain. Putting on the most severe face I could, I told him, go back to your seat, raise your hand, and tell me what you want to say. He, obe- he obediently did so, put up his hand, and when I gave him permission to speak, he told me in his little voice, it's my birthday today, and I want to give you a candy. You see, this teacher, she didn't have all the information to make a good decision on how to discipline. Christ has everything that we need. He has all the information. We can trust his discipline. His greatest concern for us and his greatest concern for this church was that they would look more like him. The most loving thing he can do is rebuke and discipline us because when we're left in our own way, we're not being conformed to the image of Christ. You see, he's not like an abusive father. He's like a loving father who wants nothing more than to help his child. See, he wants us to be effective for him. He wants us to look more like him. So if Christ didn't love us, he wouldn't rebuke us. He wouldn't discipline us. He'd say, well, I don't care if you look like me. But he gives this church a chance to repent and he tries to move them back gently by rebuking them and saying, you need to evaluate your spiritual temperature because you are lukewarm and in danger of not being effective for me. And then he goes on with this promise. Look at uh, verses um, 20 through 22. He goes on with this promise. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant to him, grant him to sit with me on my throne as I conquered and sat down on my father's throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In this last set of verses, we see that Christ is faithful even when we are not. 
You see, this church had a failure to commit to him, but Christ promised that anyone who answers the door when he knocks, regardless of whether the church remained faithful, Jesus was going to continue to save people. That Jesus was going to continue to uphold the righteousness and all of the promises of God that were in him. Remember in the introduction, Jesus calls himself the Amen, the faithful and true witness. What Jesus is telling the church is, I am the final revelation of, of God. Not only am I the final revelation of God, I am the only revelation that you need. And not only am I the only revelation you need, I am the only revelation that you can trust. I am the only revelation who can rectify the situation that's going here. So come back to me. And I believe that these final words that he's, he's uh, proclaiming to this church are a final plea for them to come back to him, to repent, realize what they've done, and turn around and become effective for him again. You see, he promises at the end of this that he will grant those who conquer a seat with him on his throne. And he can do that because he's the amen. Unfortunately for the church of Laodicea, they didn't heed the words of Christ. In fact, it's very difficult to find a Christian in that area today. We should take that as a warning that Christ does not accept half-hearted commitment. As a church, we need to make sure that our spiritual temperature is hot, that we are winning people to Christ and that we are caring more about Christ than the idols that we may place in, in place of him in this physical building or in our own lives. We must ensure that our lives reflect Christ, just as I was talking about this morning, that we are the salt and the light of the earth and bringing people to Christ. Otherwise, we are in danger of Christ spewing us out. But it doesn't just go for the church. It goes for each individual here, too. So the question is, but what about you? Have you ever responded to the call of Christ? Have you ever opened the door to Christ? This church not only, uh, this church, this verse not only tells us that Christ wants to come in and dine with us, but he wants to be the host of that dinner. That he wants all of your attention. If you've never responded to Christ and your spiritual temperature towards him is freezing, today is the day of repentance. If you've responded to Christ and you were hot for a while, but you've gone lukewarm, today is the day to repent and to turn back and to say, God, yes, I made a mistake and God has given you this opportunity to make this U-turn and to become on fire for him again. And if you're on fire for Christ today, great. Guard that fire with your life. Guard that heat like you've never guarded anything before. Always seek Christ. The church of Laodicea said, I'm going to accept these worldly things and not follow Christ anymore. We must never do that. We must always say, every single day, remind ourselves before we even get out of bed, I need Christ. And I'm going to reach people for him today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for 